I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this meeting for inviting me for it, and also for organizing this wonderful meeting. I now come to a very important slide. So Sriram, congratulations, best wishes for all your achievements, uh, and also for training so many wonderful students. And uh, many, many more innings with uh, great glory. Okay, we look forward to interacting with you forever. All right. Now, what I will talk about today is work done mainly with uh, uh, Nadia, who is in the audience, and uh, Kiran, who is on the YouTube link, and John Gibbon, who has taught us a lot of mathematics. I would like to you know, acknowledge support from all these funding agencies. Uh, these are the papers I will talk about. I'm not really an expert on active uh, matter and active systems. But once all of you give us the equations, then I study them by using the methods that we know from turbulence. So I will concentrate on the sorts of problems that uh, Rasad talked about where inertia is important. So here is uh, uh, an outline of my talk. The first is the introduction, which most of you do not need. Then the models, only to outline the models that I will be looking at. And then some illustrative results. You know, whenever we study turbulence, we say, uh, you know, turbulence requires inputs from experiments, from physicists, from fluid dynamicists, and mathematicians. So I will give you examples here of irreversibility in bacterial turbulence, active coarsening arrest and turbulence, a model in which we get self-propelled droplets without a recourse to any sort of polar or pneumatic ordering, and then a somewhat mathematical discussion of regularity criteria for the incompressible toner two equations. And there will be conclusions along the way for each one of these sections. So uh, active fluid examples, all of you know this well. Uh, this is a very well-known uh, review. Uh, the, one of the authors is in the audience. It tells you about how bacterial suspensions of uh, systems like beet subtilis, you know, set up flows for which the vorticity field looks pretty turbulent by any measure. And then there are also confined active fluids. So I'll show you a movie here of bacillus subtilis, formation of a single spiral vortex, and a dense suspension of E. coli inside a spherical droplet. If you look carefully, the center of mass is random walking. I try to give references whenever I use other people's data, but if I don't, please forgive me. They're all in the papers that I mentioned. A lot of what I talk about will be based on direct numerical simulations, so I will say this once and for all. Uh, we typically carry out pseudospectral simulations, a periodic box length 2 pi, so many grid points. We solve the nonlinear equations by a pseudospectral method, evaluate derivatives in Fourier space, products in physical space. The good thing is we don't have to impose uh, boundary conditions, even when we have the boundary of a moving droplet, uh, the fields will take care of it themselves. And of course, uh, good numerical schemes and wonderful uh, computer codes written by people like Nadia who are in the audience. Without uh, these programs, these studies are impossible. So let me start with uh, the first of these papers. I did not put up photographs of Anupam and Akhilesh, please forgive me, but they also contributed to the early stages of this work. Uh, Kiran uh, did most of this study. So, oh, you know, uh, we have uh, lots of models for, uh, uh, you know, active fluids. Here is a popular one, uh, which is called the mean bacterial velocity model, introduced perhaps for the first time in this reference. It's also called the Toner 2 Swift Hoenberg or TTSH model, uh, which is described very well in this uh, review that I referred to already. So there is this velocity field, 
Here is something which looks like Navier-Stokes, except that this coefficient here is lambda naught, and that's the pressure, obvious uh, notations. And here are terms which are reminiscent of kuramoto for uh, which most of you might know or might not know. And I will restrict myself to the incompressible case, so divergence U is always zero, even if I don't say it. I can get rid of the pressure suitably, therefore, and use a constant density rho equal to one. I note that uh, this equation is not Galilean invariant except in some particular limit when it reduces to the Navier-Stokes equation with friction. Okay, so this is just saying things that I said earlier, but I note that these coefficients, gamma naught and gamma two, uh, a spatial Fourier transform followed by some linear stability analysis will give you the wave vectors K for which there is uh, a linear instability which helps you to get some lengths. I have defined characteristic length, velocity, and time scales. And these unstable modes are what inject energy into the system more or less like kuramoto sivashinsky and in the nonlinear terms, scramble them all up, and eventually the uh, system gets into a statistically steady state, all right? And this linear coefficient alpha, depending on its sign, can either uh, pump energy into the system or take it out of it. It can act like a friction, or if you like that term, an anti-friction, okay? Again, some details, lambda naught is greater than zero for pusher swimmers like B subtilis. You can uh, sort of write an equation for an effective K-dependent viscosity, which is given here in equation three. Uh, uh, it has a URMS squared in it. That is something you would have to solve for, so let's not get into that. But we study this system of equations using a full pseudospectral DNS. If you do that, I hope you can see all that. The top row has pseudocolor plots of the vorticity field for different illustrative values of these parameters. And you can see that this flow looks pretty turbulent. On the bottom slide, I am putting the energy spectrum. So if you can't read, there's EK on the vertical axis and K lambda on the horizontal axis. It's a log-log scale. And you can see for some parameters, there is a power law regime here at low K, which people have concentrated on, like Shambhriti's group here has done some nice work on it. I think Linkman, Buffett, uh, <clears throat> Marchetti, and Eckhart also studied related models, not exactly the same, perhaps. The gray is the region where this effective viscosity is negative, and therefore it is pumping energy into the system and leading to a state which we will call a state of active turbulence. And of course, once you have a state of active turbulence, you want to characterize how it is different from conventional turbulence. And so you can you know, compute the whole uh, set of fluxes and things. So here is the uh, energy flux which is you know, going down in K. So there is an inverse cascade regime because uh, pi k is negative. However, there is really, even if you play with parameters, no region where pi k is really a constant like it is in uh, good old well-developed fluid turbulence. No matter, uh, we can see how far we can get with this. And here are plots of URMS versus alpha. So you can see that as alpha becomes positive, which is when it becomes sort of frictional, URMS goes down, so the Reynolds number goes down, the integral length scale also goes down, as I have shown here. So the system becomes less and less turbulent. Now, among, among the many properties of turbulence that you want to characterize is, uh, it, it's irreversible. But I am willing to bet that if I showed you a movie of Lagrangian particles in a turbulent flow, and I played the movie forwards and backwards, you would not be able to tell which is forwards, which is backwards. So the way to characterize that is to look at the statistics of energy increments. So I have shown you here ET plus tau minus ET, 
or the par, which is dE by dt, which basically is the same as this when you take the limit tau goes to zero, and look at its uh, PDFs. These have zero mean because we have a statistically steady state, but so you have to study these uh, skewnesses, which are normalized third moments, all right? And uh, we find that irreversibility in bacterial turbulence is inherently different from what happens in fluid turbulence because particles tend to gain energy faster than they lose it. Exactly the, the opposite happens in both 3D and 2D turbulence. In fact, as far as I know, this is the first example where this happens, though later we have also found it in counterflow turbulence in superfluids, which I will not cover today. So if you take a plot of energy of versus time versus time here, you look at this rectangle which is blown up. It is uh, gaining energy fast, but losing it slowly. In fluid turbulence, you have the opposite. You gain it slowly, but lose it fast. Of course, in any trace, you will see many such uh, you know, occurrences, but uh, you need to do full PDFs. So to make a long story short, uh, there is an important way in which these, uh, this bacterial turbulence is different from uh, uh, fluid turbulence because this, uh, you know, this skewness is positive, okay? You can tune these parameters. It's been sort of these parameters are well laid out in this nice paper by Sanjay and Joy. So I think uh, experimentalists should be able to get into this regime and put in some Lagrangian particles and check for this. All right, so change gears just to show you a little more. Uh, here is a coarsening arrest in an active Kahn-Hilliard Navier-Stokes model. Many of you might know this as an active model H, first proposed by this group here. I think uh, Michael Cates's group, uh, you have the standard sort of uh, free energy introduced really for uh, formal reasons and, uh, uh, you know, regions of high uh, psi or high density of microswimmers, low density of microswimmers, and there is an active stress term here. I will not describe all the details. Uh, they are well known to the experts. This coefficient is greater than zero for extensile swimmers, less than zero for contractile swimmers. And we will study turbulence in the case where zeta is less than zero. The first message is that this bacterial, whatever, microswimmer turbulence leads to arrested phase separation. This is the result well known in fluid turbulence. Prasad is one of the world's experts on it. You churn up a flow, and lo and behold, the two fluids don't separate. There is a length scale which you can get. And so here at low activity, you can see that the cluster sizes are somewhat big. At higher activity, which is more turbulent, uh, they are small. Okay, you can characterize this by a coarsening length scale, which I have defined here. Basically, you can get it from the... Uh, correlation function of this uh, microswimmer field. Don't look at the details, please, but you just look at this length scale L of T. Uh, when there is no activity, it is growing like good old Lifshitz layers off, T to the one third. But when you have this turbulence, it is saturating. This is an example of coarsening arrest because of active scalar turbulence. Uh, as far as I know, first time quantified like this, and the Reynolds number rises as the activity rises, and the saturation length falls, as you might expect. Uh, you can look at energy spectra. I won't dwell too long on it, because, you know, uh, we can do the details later offline. But at least uh, there seems to be an, a region with an inverse cascade, uh, and... Uh, uh, the inverse cascade regime, as in 2D fluid turbulence, is not inconsistent with a five-thirds law, okay? 
I'm not going to give you error bars on exponents and things. You can do balances of various terms, but let me not get into those details. Uh, so uh, it is sort of similar. As I said, Prasad has been the mover in this area with fluid turbulence to show how different types of fluid turbulence, 2D, 3D, uh, do lead to this coarsening arrest. And I'm hoping that we can convince Prerna and her group to check for this in the sorts of systems in which she's an expert. I don't even dare to pronounce those words. Okay. All right, now some more. So uh, now we go to a self-propelled droplet. We use the same model, but it is known that there is a very nice things happen when you encapsulate these uh, droplets of active matter. So we do that by introducing two other parameters. One phi, which is a binary emulsion, sort of oil water type distinguishing thing. So this will give us a droplet with phi high inside and phi low outside. And then there will be a field psi for active microswimmers, high where there is a high density of microswimmers, low where it is low. And these two interact in such a way with the beta phi psi term, which uh, likes both of them to have the same sign. And there are these, uh, there are these active stresses so clearly, with these equations, I won't describe every detail, but I'll be happy to explain to you how that happens. These active stresses have two coefficients, sigma 1 and sigma 2. If sigma 2 were exactly sigma 2 tilde, sigma 2 was the bare surface tension for this uh, second species psi. If you allow them to be different, then you get an activity parameter, sigma 2 tilde over sigma 2. Please take my word for it. And sigma 2 tilde is negative for contractile swimmers. So we will restrict ourselves to contractile swimmers encapsulated in a region uh, which is circular to begin with uh, uh, by virtue of the field phi. And the phi equal to zero contour is shown as a pink line which gives you the outline of the droplet. As A, the activity increases, which happens as we go down this column, first we get a propagating droplet. I will show you a movie, which is associated with a very nice dipolar flow pattern. But if you make it very high, then we get uh, a fluctuating droplet, uh, which moves in a way which we will characterize in a moment. So here is a fluctuating droplet at high activity. Here is uh, the phase separating droplet at zero activity. For those of you who know phase separation very well, you will realize that in a circular domain, phase separation occurs by the formation of rings. And here is the active droplet which self propels. It forms an umbilicus, which you will see forming now, which shoots out a bead and then it moves. And when it is doing that, the flow field, you see the dipole forms, and that's how the droplet self propels with no pneumatic, no polar, nothing. Just scalar order parameters, so that's nice. And you can characterize the motion of this droplet at intermediate activity. It is ballistic, it goes straight, that's the orange line. But when it is turbulent, it sort of jiggles all around. And with the sort of statistics we can get for such droplets, it's arguably a levy walk. Uh, you can do mean square displacement, etc., which I'm not going to spend details on. But our data are consistent with a levy walk for the center of mass. And also, you can look at the fluctuations of the perimeter of the droplet, something that Prasad and Noirita did several years ago for a simple binary fluid droplet, Khan Hilliard, Nadia Stokes, in a conventionally turbulent flow, but here it is not conventional turbulence, it's active fluid turbulence. And if you look at this plot, don't try to look at everything, this plot is a plot on the vertical axis of a non-dimensionalized perimeter of the droplet versus time. It's obviously very 
noisy, and if you're good at multifractal analysis, you can fish out a multifractal spectrum. And yes, it is multifractal. We have seen this in conventional fluid turbulence, but never in active fluid turbulence. Okay, so I've given you a little overview of droplets and active fluid turbulence again, with a special request to our experimental friends to try this. Actually, my student did try it with your student. It hasn't worked yet. We are hoping it will. And then to show you the last thing which, you know, turbulence people do, they don't understand mathematics very well, so they go talk to analysts. And analysts tell them a few sorts of things which I will share with you. So here are the incompressible toner two equations. All of you know these well. I'm always incompressible. Divergence U is always zero. You can introduce two typical velocity scales. One is U naught, which is alpha over beta square root, and U naught nu over L. Using one or the other leads to slightly different results, but no matter. All of you know how to rescale. This is what we do when we do Navier-Stokes. We introduce these rescale variables. And in terms of these rescale variables, this is the dimensionless form of the incompressible toner two equations. And the parameters that are left are these two Reynolds numbers, which are here, Re sub nu and Re sub beta. And here is um, non-dimensionalized friction, okay? The first thing to note is that these incompressible toner two equations share a certain invariance property with the Navier-Stokes equations. If I scale space variables, time variables, and velocity variables in this way, uh, then uh, they're invariant, just like the Navier-Stokes. Incidentally, people in the mathematics literature have looked at models in some other context in the sort of porous media, u, u to the power two delta. They can prove regularity for delta greater than one. Delta equal to one is an in-between region, and our results are perhaps the only ones in this area. Now, uh, those of you who like mathematics, you will define these types of norms, which are defined in 13, with suitable gradients of the velocity. And if you put in what this, you, this sort of rescaling, oops, then you get this factor of L to the one over this with this value for alpha. This goes back to an ancient and famous paper by Giopi, uh, Boyash and Timam, I think. And it's been exploited very well by John Gibbon in various Navier-Stokes contexts. And then you can uh, define this dimensionless form. And what you can prove, for example, for Navier-Stokes is that in both two and three dimensions, this object is strictly bounded above, where sub t is a time average defined mathematics style. It's not statistically steady or anything. It's the integral zero to t, one over t, d12. Okay, mathematicians, strictly speaking, analysts will say, I don't care, you start with some regular initial condition, and then I will give you bounds for what this can do. The analogs of that F for the 2D and 3D incompressible toner two equations are these PNMs and QNMs. What we can prove are inequalities 20, 21, and 22. So they look complicated. There is a a scaled activity, if you like, A naught is alpha naught, Re beta inverse. So you can ask, you know, if you do a direct numerical simulation, are you saturating these bounds or not? And the answer is no, you're not. That's the bound, and these are the data. So we are well bounded away from the, the, uh, the bound. You can also change this M, you know, you do these, all these powers M floating around. The bounds don't actually tell you how these curves should behave as a function of M, but we can calculate them in our direct numerical simulation, and they seem to stack up this way with low M here and high M there. 
They could have interchanged, and in some cases they do. For example, in the plot on the right, they do. But this is something that does not follow from analysis, but follows from numerics. You can also do uh, the so-called, uh, you know, uh, here, excuse me, the H1 norms, HN norms. Uh, this one will give you the energy and so on. So the H1 you can bound above as an equation 26. This is in 2D. I just, I'll be done in one minute. Uh, the uh, bound in 2D establishes global regularity, but that's not as good as the regularity that we have for the Navier-Stokes equation. For the 3D case, you have more complicated objects, and of course we can't prove regularity here. If we could prove regularity, we could prove it for Navier-Stokes, and then somebody would get a million dollar prize. Okay, then here are the checks. Again, the bounds are not saturated. So uh, this is in summary what I've just told you rather rapidly, but we can prove several things exactly for the incompressible toner two equations. We also have results for the TTSH, but that will have to wait for another meeting. So while I wait for your questions, you can watch these movies. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks. Uh, so uh, in the governing equations for things, right? Uh, the active stress didn't have uh, terms that mix psi and phi. Uh, why no, was no, that? No, no, they did. Which one? Uh, no, they did. The governing equation for uh, one minute. Uh, droplet. Uh, so yeah, beta phi psi. No, that's in the free energy, right? Huh. The active stress didn't have a grad phi grad psi like. <laughs> yes, uh, they no. did. Okay, we can um, try to put it in and see what it okay, does. But, but this was enough to get the moving droplet. Yeah, but I, my question was: Was it allowed? That's. I think so, right? Nadia, you have an answer? Yeah, yeah I know, but uh, he's asking a Sri Ram style question. Is it allowed by symmetry or not? <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, okay, we, we can look at it. I mean, it's fine. Uh, I had yeah. another question. Sure. Actually, uh, which is that, uh, you know, if you look at active model H in yes. the Stokes limit, you already have interrupted. Uh, you are right, absolutely. So all we have done is promoted it to inertia. Okay, okay. good. Yeah. So, but it's okay. it's right. there. Sure, I agree with you. Hi, um, you know Rahul. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, um, the little the movie you had uh, of the uh, yeah okay the just go back this one, one or two. Um, uh, you want this or you want the turbulent one? No, I, this is good. This one actually reminds me a lot of movies I've seen in Zwanimir's uh, experiments for planar confined uh, uh, active, you know, uh, the active has system. polar things. Yeah, correct. I'm just saying this, your, the clock that you had where you sort of had an instability from the boundary that proceeded in words and then another one, another one. I wonder if there's some simplifying limit in which the two can be shown to be the same because it's, it's very reminiscent unless I'm missing something. Oh, the only yes. the main point here is you can do it with scalars. Yeah, I know, I know. That's what's yeah. cool. So that's right. why then, but yeah, just a thought. So I have a question. Sure, please. So you get this one kind of nice dipole in this droplet, yes. right. even though there are like large number of swimmers inside. Yes. So how is that happening? Like all the swimmers are running in random directions and. You ultimately get a single... No, but this is the velocity field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so but each swimmer has a velocity field associated with it, right? Um, yeah, we are not looking at that scale, right? Am I yeah. mistaken? Correct. So we are not doing swimmer by swimmer, as so far as I know. They sort of uh, do uh, self-organize to this structure. So uh, it's a motility induced phase separation of contractile swimmers confined to a droplet. So uh, let's say you put a lot of chlamydomonas inside a water droplet and put in oil bath, then the sort of, uh, so they are moving in a random directions only. And uh, uh, here uh, we are taking a scalar, uh, scalar density field uh, to characterize that. Maybe we can discuss Okay, later. we should have a yeah, discussion. Right, yeah. a yes. <clears throat> so Rahul, your flight crash thing. Yes. Uh, where you showed that quite intriguing thing that in toner two, 
the flight is more than uh, is okay. shorter than the crash. PTSH. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so two questions. One mm. is short ones. One is that uh, was it in 3D or 2D, and do you expect something different? In Everything 3D? was in 2D. Okay. We don't know in 3D. We didn't do 3D well, partly because it's more expensive, but also because all the experiments are basically 2D. And the second thing was that if you had just done the Swift Hohenberg, is ah. that the property of Swift Hohenberg that you have a well, uh, uh, fl uh, a different flight crash? Because you know it could be a property of well Swift Hohenberg. How will it be forced? The just you have an opposite sign, no G gamma zero grad square u uh, minus ah, so, gamma two grad four. Okay, four. but uh, you Ignore drop the, all of these terms. Yeah, yeah. You drop all that, but you keep u dot yeah. grad u. Yeah. Okay, I haven't looked at that limit. We'll, we can try. I can okay. try. I don't know. Offhand, I don't know the answer because there is no simple intuitive way of just staring at an equation and saying the third order thing will be positive or negative. I don't know. I have to look. Yeah, it's a good question, but I haven't looked. Thank you.